at 610. Today is for April 2018. We're meeting at the central office. We have nine directors present representing eight votes. We'll start with the agenda review. Um, first off, I would like to remove one item, item 6A on the rural business policy or process. We're going to remove that uh, for another meeting. Uh, any other changes to the agenda that the board would like to make? Sure. Um, we can remove uh, the two leave matters, um, 7E, uh, Kareem Hayes, and Catherine Young. Those can be deleted from the agenda. E2, 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 E1. Okay, E.1. I Seven. have an unpaid leave request there. Yes. And we have like four of them. And there's the last two, Kareem Hayes and Catherine Young. Those both can be deleted in the agenda. Okay. Thank you, Kathy. And then at some point, I want to talk about the email that Julie sent us. Yep. Okay. It's not out or when, but. Oh, we can add it. This is okay. the time to add it. Mm -hmm. All right, good, thanks. So... <coughs> yeah, let's do that. An attachment? I don't know if it's an attachment, but it is an attachment. Okay. Yeah, I just, I thought Kevin was probably just calling that. So you want that E3? Yeah, let's make E3. Anything else? Okay. Um, we'll move for a motion to the agenda as a move. So move, thank you. I'll second. Yeah. Any further discussion on the agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor of the by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Agenda is approved 8 0. At this point, I would ask everybody to do the poll. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, this is the visitor section. Are there any visitors that want to address the board tonight? Under 5A, the consent agenda. Uh, on the consent agenda, we have a number of items. We have the approval of the minutes from uh, 21 March. We have retirements and resignations. We have the media packet. Um, we have some position eliminations due to enrollment, terminating one professional staff, uh, teacher of deaf, deaf, and one non-professional staff, one-on-one -on -one interpreter. Both cases, those students have left our district. Uh, would anyone like any of those four items removed from the consent agenda? Okay, then if there are no objections, we'll ex accept the consent agenda. Are there any objections? Consent agenda is adopted. Item six has been eliminated. eliminated. Item seven, new business. Presentation on the VSA, VSBA definition of equity. I think that's our computer. Yeah, thanks. So everybody knows, especially as school districts have merged around the state, that we've been looking carefully at equity. One of the major challenges when you say the word equity is Everybody has a different meaning, a different thought what equity means. And uh, that's not just true in this district, it's true everywhere. And the state realized that, and these state organizations realized that. And uh, so there have been challenges as people have been looking at this and talking about, well, is, is this equitable for students and things like that. So. There was a retreat on January 10th and 11th made up of um, members of the VSBA, which is the Vermont School Boards Association, and the VSA, uh, members of the, the trustees of the Vermont Superintendents Association, who met for two days 
to discuss this and to, um, with, the, with the, the idea that by the end of the second day, they would create a definition that could be used throughout the state. Uh, I was part of that. I was um, a bit cynical um, about it because we knew sometimes what happens when you put a retreat together with a whole lot of people who like to talk and uh, to come up with something worthwhile. But it was an excellent, excellent two days. It was basically 16 hours of work, but it was well facilitated. It was excellent talk going around. Um, people felt very passionately about this. And there was a lot of discussion. And what you see either up, up on the screen was the final copy of what was decided upon. Since then, this has gone out to the state. It's gone out to administrative superintendents, principals to look at. And uh, has, has gotten a good review on it. And I, I have to say that I am happy, proud, uh, <clears throat> pleased with what, what came up with it. I will tell you, and I, I, in a second I will read it, not because I don't think you can read it, but again, I think it's important for the community at large to read this. And I think sometimes when you hear it, it, it has some strength. But I will, I will tell you, there was a very big discussion about the breadth of such a document versus something like what our mission statement is, which is a sentence. And people felt every time that they came up with a sentence, it just wasn't going to, didn't do the job. So what they finally decided to do is still have their sentence, but also have full bullets that very specifically talk about equity. So then you can look at it um, to make certain decisions. So the definition is educational equity means that each student receives the resources and educational opportunities they need to learn and thrive. First of all, equity means that a student's success is not predicted nor predetermined by characteristics characteristics such as race, ethnicity, religion, family economics, class, geography, disability, language, gender, sexual orientation, gender identity, or initial proficiencies. Two, equity means that every school provides high quality curriculum, programs, teachers, and administrators extracurricular activities, and support services. Three, equity goes beyond formal equality, where all students are treated the same. Achieving equity may require an unequal distribution of resources and services. And four, equity involves disrupt disrupting inequitable practices, acknowledging biases, employing practices that reflect the reality that all students will learn, and creating inclusive multicultural school environments for adults and children. Now that's a handful, but it's a good compromise between um, very broad and very defined. And basically, if we had to put this into one sentence, which is what we did not want to do. What, what people felt passionately about was, we need to always remember that uh, equity does not always mean equal. And um, a good example that was used is each one of us and each one of our students need a pair of shoes. However, they don't have to, they don't all have to be the same size. They have to fit the student. And that's what this definition is trying to do. 
Now, I have to tell you, I think this board has worked really hard in this area, and we've got more to do as we move forward with, with making decisions. So we've done a good job with it, but I do personally feel that having a definition helps us to have something to look at um, as we move forward on that. What questions might there be on it? <coughs> so how do we score using this as criteria as a district? That's my question. Score? Yeah. I mean, this is basically how, how do we measure up to this? I have my feeling, but um, are you asking me or are you asking the group? Just asking, yeah, asking the group, I guess. I'll start. I mean, the reason to put this up here is to see what do we need to work on, right? Yeah. What, what are we, where do we need to improve? So I guess that's what I need. I would say we're 75% there. And we still have areas that we need to continue looking at. Which areas are those? Um, we're still looking at curriculum very carefully, <coughs> and ensuring that there's an adequate and equitable curriculum throughout the, the school districts. And that's a long term process, but uh, it's part of the five year plan. And it's something we, we need to continue looking through in those areas. Um, I would say some areas relative to technology are some things that one might not say is, tech, is, is um, completely equitable in all the schools at this point. But again, it's in the five-year plan, and we're working towards that. And now we have something that we can look at. Angela? I would just say that um, I don't know that this is something you can say we're there. I think you always have to keep it in mind as part of everything you do. And so I don't think you can just have a point where you can give us a percent. I think you always have to be looking at this in all the areas that are there. It has to be an ongoing conversation as the organization moves forward. So I think it's important to keep that in mind. Right. So when I see this, I don't look at it and say, OK, what up there are we doing? I look at it and say, what up there are we not doing? Mm -hmm. I'm intrigued by the last one. <coughs> Disrupting inequitable practices, technology applies. That's got to be the dolphin stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just identifying what those are. Why do we keep this in the back of our mind? We keep revisiting this, though, so we are, because that question does come up time to time. I mean, I'm not saying every board, but maybe every year this gets revisited to remind people. I, I mean, I'm just putting it out there because, you know, the five-year plan, and that will get us. But once we, how do we know we've reached 100%? I think Angela's right. Number one, we'll probably never reach out. Oh, I know. I know. So uh, it's, it's a goal that we're working toward. Um, and I completely agree with you that this is something, just like the mission statement, that's something we revisit. We continue looking at that. When we're making decisions, if there's any thoughts or challenges or what we're looking at, we should be, we should be looking at that as, um, as a guide. Well, I think that this is something that the board wants to agree to agree with and embrace, maybe we should post it somewhere in this room. Don't have to paint it on the wall. But, <laughs> um, and then as administration makes recommendations to the board, you can say, well, this really, you know, we're doing this because it's, this falls under the second bullet here, and that's mm -hmm. why we're doing it. <clears throat> you had brought up the last bullet. and. For me, yeah, the work we've done with Rebecca Haslam this year um, has really got us thinking about that. And, um, and I think um, Jill might have mentioned we had done some work with the admin team around looking at you know our identity, our own personal identity, and where our bias come from. Um, we did that at State Tech with our staff, and we actually had Rebecca come back, and she actually um, spent a day with our eighth grade students and teachers. Um, so it's just interesting to see that piece, but what people think 
um, what they believe about things and their practices and how they see things. So I think that that's going to be an ongoing kind of process. But I think um, you know, as leaders, thinking about what that means and how to help our staff see things differently um, and really be a little bit more sensitive to how we view things based on our own experiences. So. Well, I would love to hear uh, any time an inequitable practice is identified and uh, it's disrupted. So, oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, two, two uh, thoughts. One, as we consolidate it over time, we're going to have to look at what are the differences among and between the schools, what are some schools doing and have been doing it one other school may not have had in their curriculum or whatever. Those are kind of uh, easy things to look at, but difficult to put in place in terms of finances and so forth. And I can see it taking time to do that. Also, our children coming to school have biases from their homes. And we as educators should have strong beliefs in what you know, this represents and what should be in place and trying to instill in our children uh, a proper way of thinking about equity and bias and prejudice and different things. And uh, I know in my own school, this is a struggle because sometimes we're talking about what the children feel is family values. And sometimes the family values are really not what should be. And so there's a, a real um, tension there. So to really believe in certain things and the way certain things should be, and then working with kids and what their beliefs are when they come to school is sometimes difficult to referee and address and teach. Well, I was going to say, it's hard to know kind of where the inequities are unless you really put, you know, say, to against town, uh, city school against Fairfield and really kind of look at what's offered, what isn't offered, what's offered at the different schools, not knowing <clears throat> until you really kind of look at that, outside, even outside the curriculum. Yep, and then how do you bring the high school in here? So. I would like to hear from the students um, in regard to what they what they're aware of or how they how they see things as being inequitable in some way. I, I think they can be brought into the conversation. And I think in many ways that high school is somewhat simpler because it's a collective group of students. Like so I'm gonna say right off the top of my head when I think about technology and educational inequities in that I'll use my own experience having to purchase extra computers for every student in high school because each child needs their own computer. Having to make sure the internet is working for each, you know, every day. You know, so if you don't have the money to buy an extra computer, if you don't have the money to have internet on every night, that totally separates out who's even eligible to come to some of these classes. You know, so in some ways, it seems like high school is, I don't want to say easier, but it's a collective versus three different areas. The great equalizer. And I would say your leadership team, the people around this table, are dealing with that pretty much constantly. I can't think of a meeting that doesn't come up, and something doesn't come up that's equity related. And it's this group does deal with them um, and will continue. As I say, the goals that we've got within the five-year plan, I think we continue to be in that direction. But it's a, it's a growing, it's a process. I think Joan has something. I just think, I look at this more as a lens, and I think it's a lens that helps us every time we're ready, ready to make a, a decision as a group. And it's really kind of nice, um, the work we've been doing, because more times than not, when someone who really shouldn't be putting something on the table to give it up, and we're just like, no, we're not going to take that from your school because that we're working towards equity. Remember, you're not going to give that up. You, don't, you need. So that's what you'll see us doing a lot of times as we look through this. We use it as a lens 
for every decision we're making. Is this decision moving us closer to equity? I was sort of part of the problem is um, in terms of equity when it might extend beyond the confines of the schools themselves. You mentioned like in Fairfield, uh, most kids in the city or town, I imagine, the parents of some means, have, can have an internet of a speed adequate to do homework and whatnot. In Fairfield, I don't even know what the options are for internet. Satellite or over the phone line. Over the phone line, so it's quite a bit different. Well, I would imagine. Yeah, so I mean, that's something that's soon out of our hands, but something to keep in mind. Well, also in, in Fairfield, let's just remember the state promised to wire Fairfield, and they didn't finish, or Fairpoint didn't finish. They're supposed to wire all the way out to all sections. The boondocks were everywhere. It was supposed to be wired with DSL at least. Um, and so a lot of people have been using Surf Global, which I used for years, until the trees grow. And then you got to either cut the tree or, or raise the antenna. So that leaves dial up and that leaves HughesNet and that becomes an issue. Uh, and, um, and it becomes an issue about kids being able to do their Googles. Everything's on Google in the high school. And I'm speaking about the high school. I don't know how much of the Google work is done in, in middle school right now. But it, it does bring up that issue. And what do we say to the state is, look, our town isn't wired. You guys said you were going to wire it. They said it two years ago, and then somehow it stopped. I got wired, but I live next to St. Albans. But I think that there's sheer economics involved as well. Yeah, so I mean that's exactly right, it right there. Whether totally, whether you have access or not, yeah. it really depends on financially. Yeah, can't it, afford it. Does, yeah, it doesn't really matter if you live in city or town or right. Fairfield. If your yeah. if your parents can't afford it, you right. you know if they can't go out and get another <coughs> Chromebook, which people you know it's only two hundred dollars, but two hundred dollars when you go to the food shelf mm -hmm. and when you're searching for food shelves. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I have actually retrieved stuff from the stuff the BFA is throwing out and was able to actually upgrade them and rebuild them for kids who are doing their homework on their phone and, and just give them a notebook or a, a laptop that, uh, that would work for Google. I mean, so stuff's being thrown out that could, could be redistributed <coughs> that will allow you to access the internet. You don't, you don't need to sing the run uh, high-powered calculation or anything like that. You need to just get on the internet and get to the Google Docs. So there's some things I think are being overlooked in, in that sense too as far as getting technology that the schools get rid of that might just need a little tweaking that we can get to a kid and we might be able to yeah. need it. Yeah. That's a good point. Thank you. The way I read this, it's not about uh, schools, you know, uh, what's happening in town versus what's happening in the city because it's, it focuses on student success or student learning so it's any individual student and that, that means that you can easily look at BFA at the only high school in the district but if there's any uh, inequity there from student to student to student that's something that we want to okay. I like it Kevin so do I. I think it's something we can use. Let's post it somewhere. Okay. Good Kevin, idea. Kevin, did you say you sent it out to parents or just the teams? So we sent it out to the team right now at, at this point but because we want the board to see it first. Would this be something sent out to? I could see that this would go in our newsletter. I think that would be yeah. really well. Yeah. And how many schools are involved in this? Or? It's all state. The whole state. So, hearing that, this may um, <clears throat> be defined differently in different areas too, right? The, the, the examples that people can grab onto and, and look at. I mean, the shoe example is very good because it kind of makes you under if you're thinking, well, would be a good example of that? The shoe example like, is really obvious, but. You know, the economic piece is pretty huge, and it's going to be different in different communities in the state. I mean, we've got a diverse economic base in this supervisor unit, and it has nothing to do with whether you've got access to internet, right? It's whether you can pay for it. And it's a lot bigger than sometimes we do. Yep. I don't know what I just said there, but 
<laughs> well, what, what's great is because it is a statewide yeah. uh, thing that people from all over the state with VSB and, and superintendents being involved and them bringing it back to their leadership teams, to their boards, this is something that's just going to grow. And yes, every community is different and as such, there are going to be different equity issues. But right. I think it would be great for the same group to come back a year later and talk about their example of this. <laughs> Anything else on this? I just have one more comment. I'm sorry. You know when you say you use it for, I just keep processing this longer than the rest of you have, okay? But if you think you use your mission statement to make decisions and you probably, you know, we use the vision values, what are they called? You guys, I can't remember what we call them. Core values. I mean, and this is just another one of those, as Joan said, right? It, it, it's like the lens, but you can't, this doesn't stand alone. All those things have to kind of go together when you're looking at decision making or project planning and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, I'm done. You're done. Great job. Yeah. It's a package deal. Okay. Let's move on to 7B, which is student safety. That's me again. You have an attachment with that. We, um, we tried, the, the leadership team tried to give you something that was general enough for you to see what's going on without getting too defined or too to hit into any confidential areas relative to what's happening around safety in the schools, which by its very nature you want to keep. Um, you don't want the people, the perpetrators out there to know what's, what's happening on certain things. Um, what, what the leadership team wants you to hear is the fact that people are working on this very hard, have been doing it for very long, are continually tweaking, looking at their plans. I cannot say enough about our um, police. They're, you know, I've, I've lived in several places in Vermont and I've never had the collaboration um, that we've had with this police force. They are, are, are wonderful. Either through the SROs or with Gary Chief Taylor. Um, we work very closely with them. They know our buildings. They know what's going on in the buildings. They have plans. They can tell you every hallway, <coughs> room, and they have those maps. We continually work, work through drills, and every single time, I, 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 I would hazard a guess that any principal would tell you that every time they do some sort of drill, they find something. Um, whether through lockdown, through an emergency drill, whatever. Obviously, I think Chris would, would certainly agree that when we actually had the um, the threat two months ago or so, um, we learned from that. And um, that allowed Chris and his team with, with Gary Taylor to uh, tweak some of those things and fix some of those. So it, it's continually being done. Will it, this is another case that I guess we were talking about earlier. Will it ever get totally done? No, because you, you never can hit all the what ifs, but you can, you can be prepared and you can do the best you can and you can make sure you have a good quality group of people who understand the structure um, and what needs to be done within an uh, emergency situation. So, 
that's where we are at this point. Um, I don't know if there's anybody in the leadership team that would like to add to that. But I have a question. Does the police department or through the school or through the whatever uh, uh, administration is involved, in, how is this funded? I mean, is there extra funding for this? Do we get uh, special, uh, uh, or is this just part of the job of the police department? It's part of the job of the police department. Okay. You may notice that there's something in the legislature right now. <clears throat> Um, where they're looking at that and looking at maybe some additional funding, but I don't see that. I, wasn't there a grant a few years ago with the state for emergency preparedness? Because I know the hospital tapped into that, and it requires local agencies to meet on a regular basis to plan for uh, emergency, not just not just emergency prep like terrorism, but emergency prep like everything. I don't know if. Uh, Schools tapped into it, but I believe the community tapped into some of that grant. So there's some. Well, they certainly have those those meetings. Yeah. How they're funded, I I, I don't know. Um, so yeah. SROs, for instance, might are, are funded out of our budget. Okay. Uh, but we work very closely with the police department to make sure we have the right people in those positions. And I'll tell you. Given some of what I've seen in the Vermont, they just work so well with us. There are communities that, and police departments that really don't want to take the time to actually give away one of their people to, to work in the schools. We don't have those issues here. You know, they work carefully with whether it's uh, Angela or whether it's Chris to make sure they get the right people there. We will, that, that's paid for by us. But otherwise, <coughs> as far as the work they do, it's, just what they do with us. So in the past, um, because of the uh, police arrangements, um, contracts with the towns, Fairfield would deal with the state police. And my understanding was is that now that we're consolidated, Fairfield can access the resource officers uh, from within the, the district as well. Or are we talking, we have two different things going on here. Right. That's still in flux. Okay. But we're we're looking at that. We still we share our SROs when needed. Yeah. Uh, state police are still the the what's the word I want? Designated. Contract designated. 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 Thank you. Uh, people, but our police department has plans for the for the Fairfield School with all the maps and and what to be done and what the emergency uh, protocols are and things like that. But thankfully, they work well with the state. So the, that collaboration is happening too. It's not one of these cases where you sometimes see where your your local police uh, and your your cities don't work together. Right? So city police and the state police are coordinating their effort to provide services to Fairfield. Right. Would having an SRO uh, officer at each school ever be contemplated? Is that just too expensive, or is that not seen as necessary? There's various reasons, Steve, why that hasn't been done, as I understand it. Some of it's philosophical um, around the, the idea of having a police officer in a school. Uh, I guess you've heard the debate anyway about arms and schools and things like that. Having said that, and the perfect, I, you know, town really has the SRO, but if Joan ever needs to, to use that SRO, there's the sharing process. And the SRO from either BFA, depending on the need and, and the time of day and things like that, they're aware of it. If they're needed to be over in the city, they are. Right. I was just wondering whether a discussion has been had amongst you as to whether or not philosophically you feel that those are lost minutes transferring, or whether, uh, again, whether or not it would be worthwhile to consider having dedicated officers at all schools. What is it, about $100,000 for? I know it's not very expensive. Mm -hmm. Just, not just not that much. About seven, seven, mm -hmm. Town School has a full-time SRO? We do. And for how long? How many years? Five? Five. 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 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think some of it's just philosophy. Um, I, I just, I mean, obviously, I was a big supporter of that. That's why we have one. But um, I just feel um, school safety should be proactive, not reactive. Um, and we just, I mean, for us, it's part of it's part of the school culture. And I mean, we also have like an amazing SRO. Um, and he connects with kids and families and just very active. So to me, that just is just part of the, the school community and the sense of belonging and safety um, and, and just being there. So, um, so anyway, there's just different philosophies in the way that you can look at it and the way you want to approach it. So everyone has yeah. some different thoughts. And okay, just I mean, what are this also comes up not only to equity, but also with the philosophy of each school, as to whether or not, um, whether city or the, um, the airfield or whoever would be comfortable having one. That's part of the discussion, I guess. Is that how it works? How it work? and I don't know that it's so much, because um, to be honest with you, I wouldn't mind having one. I just don't know what I'd give up to do it. That's where, to me, the big thing comes in, is that we're being pushed so hard around cost right. that adding is just not the thing you do today. So you've got to find something that you're willing to say, I'm going to trade this for this. Okay. And that's a hard decision to make when you feel like you've already cut the okay. things that you can really cut. So I think that becomes the future. I've been waiting to see what they do at the state level. Like, how important is this? Is this something you're going to give us an exemption on? <laughs> no, <laughs> we I used to have grants. Yes. Grants, yes. And I was also wondering if that's going to happen. Are they going to do grants well, and stuff? Well, maybe they will. Well, isn't the state um, taking a look at every school to see how prepared they are? For They're doing a safety yeah. audit in every school. Yeah, they had a grant when we first got this SRO. Yeah, so I think it was right. like two or so three years. And that was, it was almost one of the fears yeah. of going with a grant because we were like, oh my God, we're going to get used to this. Then we're going to have to pay for it. And yeah, that's yeah. exactly mm -hmm. what happened. Yeah. <laughs> for every school all of a sudden to have one that the money has to go somewhere just didn't know. Yeah. Is there a possibility that we don't need one in each school, we need somebody jumping around? Or? That's a reactive yeah. opinion. No, I mean just jumping sort of around. scheduling. Well, you, you know, then no, you can just no, call the police. Right? No, 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 just yeah. visiting the schools at, at an unannounced schedule. Uh, to, to serve those functions. Yeah. I, it's, I'm not really sure what I'm asking. It's, it's a good no. question, but how do you know when you would need them? Right. That's just it. Then you'd That's be calling. The then you'd be calling them is when you. Right. Is when they're not there. That's. Yeah. So, so it's also really important to understand what the proactive approaches are. This is not the only proactive approach, and I, and the way Angela uses her SRO is really around creating relationships with students, and that's the approach we took. In lieu of it was, if you look at the places where things are happening, it's because someone is angry or hurt or or trying to get revenge against feeling not connected. So that's kind of been more the path. That's another path that's also proactive, which is the path of making sure people feel included and involved. And that's sort of a path you can take in a lot of ways. So I know there's there's more than one path to. For school safety, I just I know this mm -hmm. one's getting a lot of attention lately, and I was just mm -hmm. mentioning it as is it an option being discussed, and how if one wanted to, where does the money come well, from? Well, I think when you look at our next agenda item, it makes oh. it a little bit challenging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean that. So right. we're trying to balance. <laughs> but to Mike's point, I I could see because you were talking about the mm -hmm. SRO builds community and forges relationships that you know even if and I'm just going to say even if the SRO was at town school five days a week from nine to noon and city school five days a week from there's still that opportunity to forge relationships and make connections in a proactive approach versus just running to city school when there was an issue or town school when there was an issue we found it very helpful because we have issues beginning of the day parents come in the middle of the day the end of the day where you've got a problem and so it's just been nice just knowing yeah. you're on the rate, you're just on the normal little walkie talkie, you know, Angela to Roger, yep, okay, I need you here, and boom, he's like right there. Because it's hard to predict when you're going to have a parent, there's like a heat, heated custody mm -hmm. issue and you need someone, or there's, um, you know, someone comes in to pick up who shouldn't be driving, 
which happened. You know, so those are things. So those are hard to say, well, that won't open, happen on Tuesday afternoon. You know, that's the hard yeah, part no. to predict that right. piece of it. So, yeah. So I think it's an ongoing kind of conversation for sure. Else? Are we ready to leave this? Okay. Efficiencies. <coughs> That's present and future. Back to you. I feel this is the Kevin Dirt show today. <laughs> Sorry. What you, the board asked us to talk about. Um, efficiencies and, and after it coming through our last um, budget cycle where we would be looking in the future towards uh, towards these efficiencies I felt to be able to do that we had to look at the, the big picture and not just look, looking forward but also looking back a little bit to where we merged and um, what we've already done towards some of these efficiencies. So that's where we were starting. And so I, I, I've given you a list of things that have done, been done up to this point. And I'm, I'm not sure you want me to go through every single item other than to give you some just generalizations. Uh, you'll see some places where it's not applicable. I remind the board that even when we started merging, we talked about the fact that the major reason for merging um, was not necessarily cost savings, but student learning, student opportunities. So sometimes there are some things in there that not didn't save us any money, but enhanced the program. And that's where the non-applicable non stuff would, would go in. Other things actually saved us money. So, um, Brenda, let's stick to the first one just for a sec. Thanks. Um, most of these you know, because uh, you've been part of it. So obviously we, we save money on, on tuition payments. We'll continue to do that, do that for a few years. Um, we did do the bar loan and state tech move. We did. We will next year. Yeah. That's I just remember that was a discussion point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was... So it's made the city really happy because they wanted bar loan back uh, for their rec program. And the walls and doors are ordered. <laughs> and. <laughs> Kudos to, to, to Jason and Angela on that because I do think the more we can have our kids in our schools just makes, makes it better for all. So, and, and it saved us a little, a little sum for Rift. I'm just glad you did it because when I was at that meeting, I thought you weren't going to do it. You know, that it was out there as an option and it just seemed like it made perfect sense. It was a win-win. And so did we eventually, but... Angela had to look at how that was going to handle when you've got a school that's pretty full already. Yep. And, um, and she made that work. So. <laughs> I, you probably don't want me going through the whole list. So I would just ask you if, and, and we'll go down this, and there's another two pages of this. But if there's any questions like Jeff had, just let me know before we move to, to page two. Okay, so could we move to page two, Brent? Also for clarification, just, just so that it's clear, where it says NA under associated costs, it doesn't necessarily mean that there was no savings. It just might be hard to quantify. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good point. Because some of them I think are a little Yeah, there's some, there's there's some, big. There's some money yeah. saving, but it's hard to you know, say exactly how much. It's a benefit. <coughs> it's hard to set up. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. I mean, something like pre-K students being bused means that you have a higher enrollment. The kids are not only getting 
the education we want them to get, but it also impacts our average daily membership, which helps the tax rate. So, you know, some of those things are not as easy as a single member. Right. Right. There are no questions on page two. We'll go to page three. I mean, that one that is uh, second from the bottom, building in-house and in-house capacity to reduce out-of-district placement contracts. Mm -hmm. That might be quantifiable, except yes. you can't quantify without probably mm -hmm. break it for us. It's going to take time <laughs> right. to yeah. yes. build it, and then there will be, there will yeah. be cost savings, but you yes. have to start ground up and then yeah, mm -hmm. move it forward. So, so. Mm -hmm. So we have a number of students who require a high level of support and intervention to be successful in school. And typically, in some instances, we don't have capacity in the school to serve them without having a contract from an outside agency. And it's a good deal of money. Uh, so um, we're at the tipping point where we've made some investments in the budget so that we can hopefully reduce that reliance on outside contracts and have our own staff that can serve those kids. That's an equity issue, too, that we're trying to address. And you may see that down the road, because it's a case of spending money to save money um, over time. So that's, it is a slow process. But um, <coughs> Julie and Joanne have worked on that quite a bit, and we're to to look at how we can do that. So are these students actually placed off-site in other facilities? In this instance, we're talking about children that are in our schools. In our schools. Mm -hmm. And yes, there is a population of students that are placed in other places. Right. Well, yes. if, you're, if you're saying reduce out-of-district placement, that's not in our schools, right? Right. Right. That's out. Both. Right. So, we, I so mean, we have people that go to school in other schools. Correct. In the state or out of the state. Even. So it's building capacity to bring those kids back yeah, when it's yes. appropriate, and then also building capacity so that we can serve those kids so they don't have to go someplace else. Right. It could be Project SOAR or Project Massachusetts. I mean, you know, depending on what's going on. Depending on the scene, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, next page. <laughs> So, you also asked us to look at, at where we're looking further down the road. <coughs> and the next three pages will show some of that. So, uh, these I, I do want to talk about a little bit. It does look like we will not be replacing um, Mr. Lyons. Well, he's irreplaceable. Exactly. Right. <coughs> what are you going to do with the other half of the salary? <laughs> 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 it's true. It's irreplaceable. It's a white <laughs> uh, and, and that is going to give us an opportunity to also look at, at our program at BFA and to look how it's done um, with, um, with Jeff not there. And also, number two, you may or may not know that we uh, Preston is our director of guidance, who's also an administrative position. We are looking carefully at, at that becoming, not becoming an administrative position, um, keeping Preston and uh, having him as, as guidance counselor and also as a department head for the guidance program. He's requesting that. It makes sense in many ways. Um, we have a not applicable because we're not. Sh Number one, we're not sure totally on that, and we're not sure what that, the cost savings would be. That's more of a, we believe this will be a good way of actually enhancing and increasing capacity for our guidance people. So between the two of them, we're looking, uh, we're starting the process of what would that look like, and how would it be different with, um, within our administrative structure, but with, within our other ranks of BFA. And how can we do things differently, but actually increase communication, increase efficiencies, um, 
And so we're all going to get together and be talking about that over the rest of the year. We're looking at, that's a point, that's a, yes. I was just going to ask, is this just over the first year? Or is this reaching out multiple years? Good question, and that's why there are three pages. This page, as you can see from the year realized, um, it's basically this upcoming year. Nice. Um, where? I'm not sure about your arithmetic. It's all three pages. It's all three pages. <laughs> so I'm sure <laughs> that's right. <laughs> It's actually bad this with the takes. I feel a little better. <laughs> uh, and the other things are small things. Because of enrollment, we're looking, uh, a, a Fairfield teacher is looking to, um, has requested a little less time. And because of enrollment, we're able to do that. There'll be some savings. The science um, teacher? Yes. Um, we're also looking at dual certification for our middle school teachers. Uh, now, what that means is right now, some of our schools have already done that. I know SATEC is pretty much at their middle school level totally dual certified, right? Mm -hmm. And Joan, you've got some. Um, but the, if, if it allows it to, with some um, schedule, <coughs> you can actually decrease teacher time if they're dual certified. Um, with some creative scheduling and stuff. Uh, so we're looking, <laughs> looking to complete that process. And that dual certification is in all schools? Yes. Is it by subject matter or grade level? Pretty much middle school we're looking at. So six, seven, eight. So someone, what's the dual? Dual means, so for instance... I know what it means. I mean, I know it means two. <laughs> and so for instance, instead of just being an English teacher, you might be an English social studies teacher okay. and have certification in both. Okay. That allows you to do more creative, creative scheduling and use those teachers. Got it. Or math and science. All middle level, all middle level licenses are dual endorsed. So you have to have two, endor two endorsements to get a middle school license. Oh, I see. But you can also teach middle school with a 712 and a K6 license where you wouldn't have to be doing it. Okay. Well, that's interesting, 712. So you could actually extend this argument in wow. high school. We've had folks in middle school with 712, but the middle level gives you a, a different philosophy around working with that age group. So we prefer that. And mm -hmm. in, in you know, the 5-8, it's but um, you know you can have that philosophy and be a you know a, a K six teacher teaching in five six um, depending on what your background is, but the endorsement you know covers those areas. Um, idea. Yeah, we have a, a small amount with the business office, um, a, a small savings there. Martha, I don't know if you want to mention what that basically is. What that is is Collins Perley currently um, has their payroll process through a company called Gay Data, and they pay for that service. And Dave and I have been talking for the last couple of years, and hopefully this year we actually implement it. But the uh, business office takes over that function of that process, um, basically as a purchase service, but I don't charge. <laughs> And, and, the, and the best part is, even though there may or may not be some savings, the very best part is I'm not going to have to hear from Dave about we need to do this for another year. Why don't I mention that? Yeah. Every time you see me. So can I ask a uh, question that's kind of about reducing staff levels? We, we've uh, seen material before about uh, if we raise the teacher-student ratio even by one, we save a certain amount of money statewide. Is that right, Kevin? And, I mean, are we looking at... We're not done yet. Okay. Thank um, you. We'll talk about that. Thank you. And yes, to your answer. So, up through this next fiscal year, 
I felt it was important for you to see the number uh, that you've done and we've done through the through the merged district, and it's a million dollars. And I'm not sure you were aware of that. So, um, and I'm really really proud of this group. That this was a lot of work through these last two years, and those of you who've been through it on the board or in the leadership know how much time, effort, collaboration, uh, flexibility, thinking outside the box went into doing that. So, um, and it's not always easy. This next year that we're looking at, not replacing Jeff, and looking at what that's gonna look like, that's not gonna be a, a, a split decision. It's gonna be a lot of work into what the, how that's gonna be done. I personally, as the eternal optimist, think we can actually make something that's gonna be, be better, more efficient, more effective as we move forward, but it is losing staff members Look. on that. So, that's up through, next, through this next fiscal year. At this point, I want you to, I want to, I know most of you know this, but I want to go through the five-year plan, not one at a time, but I want to show you some of the other things that we're looking at in future years. And I'm sorry, it's small. Um, and when, yeah. So maybe if we could start, Brenda, on the, yes, on the left side. Much of this, the blue stuff we've already done, and it's the stuff we've talked about, and I'm not going to take time now unless you have questions. It's stuff we've already accomplished. Um, when we get down to number seven, we're talking about uh, technology. This is an area both of equity and cost that we're going to, that we're looking at, and we're starting the technology study next year. Uh, with the idea of centralizing that. That, again, will be both from an efficiency point of view and a cost point of view. The curriculum, number eight, is ongoing. This year has been kind of a slide year, in, um, and we knew it would be, um, with Sean out in Fairfield and with, with Jill working hard over here. Um, but next year, I think we're going to get rolling again on that, and that will definitely may not be a cost issue, but it will definitely be an equity issue, and and really getting it uh, for student learning. Um, it, nine's not really a huge thing, cost wise. Ten is the whole equity issue. And you can see we're right where we need to be. Discussion and definition of equity in this year. The, the evaluation stuff is stuff we need to work on and we need to work on to make sure we're consistent throughout the, the, um, the schools. But from a cost point of view, it's not going to be a major issue. Twelve is going to take some time but we do believe the more we can, as a merged district, start talking about our vendors and our purchasing and do some of that in, in bigger bulk items, we think we can save some money. Just think of technology again. Right now we're buying computers separately in each different school. They're all looking different. Uh, they're all doing it um, in their schools. We're looking at more from a centralized point of view. We can save some money. Uh, PD, but that's that again is something we need to work on and important, but probably not part of this discussion. Any questions before we go to the next slide? If if I ask, will I be getting ahead of myself? Of that? Is it about any of these things? Well, you have uh, food contracts up there. I was wondering yeah. about transportation. You got that? I don't know. We'll do it. Well, I I just so I. <laughs> it's kind of discouraging that we only get one bid. Oh, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, and then... Do we have that on our next slide? 
the soil. <coughs> Yeah, I understand where you're coming from. Um, Number five, it was on the first slide. That's right, it was on the first slide, so no, you did not get ahead of yourself. Okay. Uh, we are, I'm glad you brought that up, Mike. We are looking at um, efficiencies in the busing system. We haven't started that yet, but we have been. It has been discussed, and we have a consultant who believes we need to look at owning our own buses. And, and we, so we do need to update our plan there. So thank you for mentioning that. Because the study's been done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did not work. So now we need another study. And we know that. So what was the study cost? Well, that was done, and that's how we're, we've got oh, okay. the transportation system we've got which has done a lot of good stuff. Right. However, the cost savings were not as big as we hoped, and that's now, now that we, we've, we're serving more people better, now we have to look at the next step, which is how can we um, create some cost savings? And there are people out there, including the consultant we were working with, who says we should research owning our buses. That, that also goes along with something that's going to, that it is in the next slide. Because you can't do that without having an operations director yeah. who's running that. And that's actually in the next slide. Okay. Um, but thank you for bringing that up. We do have need to update that. Brendan, could we expand on that too? Thanks. So 15, again, we're working more on, a lot on behavioral issues, um, MTSS work. Uh, it's very important for student learning. Again, it's probably not part of this conversation. We're working on hiring. And boy, that's, that's a challenge. We're not there yet. We continue to work on it. It's different when you're hiring in one school and when you're hiring over a school district of our size. And thank God we've got the communication going on with our leadership, but that's still work we're working, we're, we're doing to, to get a system down that works best. Calendar, that's all done. Mission done, core values are done. Uh, you will hear very quickly, it might be at your next meeting, um, discussion, to move forwards on a unified phone system, and taking us away from this antiquated system we have that um, is pretty bad. So, um, <coughs> and that will be a money thing that we'll be talking about. It will be coming out of capital, capital funds. Just the handbook's done, negotiations is done, Catherine Street's done. And that needs to be updated um, on number 25. So where's the operations director? Where did I don't I know. Is there a third page? page? I'm Was sorry? There a third page, maybe? No? Well, it, we'll have to check where it is, but one of the, the, the thing that doesn't seem to be on there is we're looking at a centralized operations director that would go along with the busing, because you need to have somebody in does that work? Now our consultant is telling us, and that's why we have to do the research, that buying your own buses and having a full-time operations director is still cheaper than contracting out. And that's what we have to, have to look at. It's not something, right now Martha kind of takes care of buses, and I don't think that she, she wants to take that on. She does. So this, this, this director for buses, or are we talking about No, it would be a bigger thing. Facilities. The operations director would be doing buses, but it would also be centralized custodial. That's what it I would mean. be all the facility yeah. issues. Okay. And that, that has potential to, to be some very significant cost savings. Kevin, you number six. <coughs> I'm sorry? It's number six. Six? Oh, number six, Unified Operations Manager. So why did We didn't notice it. Because it was made too big and I didn't see that. Gotcha. So, the, so that's it, Mike, on that one. 
And that's what we're, that's what's in the works um, starting next year to start looking at, at, uh, at doing that. The final thing, which is not on here, and, I'm, and I'll have to talk to our team about whether we want to put it on here, is what you again talked about, Mike, was, was looking at issues such as uh, class size. Um, that's a hard discussion, and it's a balancing act, <coughs> but it's a discussion probably worth having. If, the pro well, you are looking at it through attrition right now. We are looking at it through attrition. <laughs> That it's easier, it's somewhat easier, and Chris will probably frown at me. It's somewhat easier to look at it at the high school where you have multiple classes all t being taught the same thing um, versus the elementary where you may have two or three certain classes. So it's hard then to raise class size by one or two and do any good. But it's something we need to look at. Um, and that is a discussion we're gonna be having this year. Well, in order to lower your cost per student, because that's really what we're looking at, right? yep. there's, there's really only that I can think of three ways to do it. You can either increase your students, you can decrease your spending, or you can increase your revenue, right? Because that gets taken off the top mm -hmm. before that gets calculated. The revenue gets kind of hard to control. I mean, it's grants and stuff. Mm -hmm. Students, you can't. I mean, it's hard. You, it's hard to manage the number of students you have. I mean, it, it is what it is. So it really comes down to decreasing spending. We agree. And eighty and what we know that over eighty percent of our spending is um, employed. Which is a wonderful segue into my last slide. Um, I would say one thing about revenue and students would be um, making your high school a desirable place. Sure. Can more yeah. even more desirable. So. Yeah, it's tough to do in a short run, but so it's a balance of investing and certain things that would attract kids, is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. and, then, and also being mindful of the student count. And, and inversely, not hurting program to the point that people don't want to come. Yeah, and, right. <clears throat> um, Brenda, can we go to that last slide? I just, as I end this, this presentation, Jim hit it right on the button. And I just want to make sure you see where the major contributors are. 80% of, of our costs are salary and, and benefits. So the, the above line gives you your total budget for the year, which came up to a 3.09% increase. Our total salary and benefits after a negotiated package, which we did this year, came to 3.55% increase. One thing hopefully you see there is that the total budget was less than the total increase in salary and benefits. So that shows you right away that there had to be savings in other places for that to happen. It's also important to note that this, this contract, whether it's support staff or, or professional staff, was a very well done, well thought out, well structured, well compensated, competitive contract. And it, it, it needed to be for many reasons because of the merger and everything else. However, we can't forget the fact that 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 is the major contributor to our cost. It's not like other things are not being looked at or dealt with or tried to make efficiencies uh, and we're trying to just blow everything else. Because you can see we tried to save a million, we have saved a million dollars. But now we have to look at it from the point of view. The salary benefits, 
down the road might be a little bit better, given some of the things that we did in our in your negotiations. Um, but it's still going to be a major contributor. So if we make changes, we can make an awful lot of cha changes in, in supplies and not get us anywhere. The only place we're going to do it is through our staffing. And that's not easy. Um, it's looking at things differently. And, it, and without hurting program, it's, going to, it's, it's taking us some time. Uh, but I think the team is trying. And that's my presentation. <laughs> What is the salary benefits? Because we have a three-year contract. Is that total of the three years? I saw 18, 19. The third year is the 20. It's FY20. Is that the, 20, the third year? Yeah, what you saw was just the first year of the contract. So what are the next two years going to look like? What are those numbers going to look like? Same? Similar. Similar? Well, we don't know what the dollar increase will be. Right. Depends on how many yeah. teachers there are. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Depends on how many staff we still have. I know. <laughs> Don't forget that because of the good job you guys did, the rate of increase will be less than yeah. it would have been. Mm -hmm. But we can't totally give you that information. <laughs> I can predict that it will be. Yes, a similar rate, right, right, right. And we know that healthcare is going down. <laughs> <laughs> And, and just to make sure I've been clear, that is in no way criticism of the negotiations process or what we did. I want to make sure that's very clear. Because of what we've done, it was a give and take. Nobody got everything we wanted. No, uh, at the same token, we've become competitive around the state. And because of that, we're finding good people. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thanks, Kyle. Nice job. That brings us to 7D, which is an update on finding some lead at City School. John, you want to sure. Give so, in your packet, you have the letter that I sent to families after we got our results. Um, actually, our results ended up being really good. And that is only because over the last five years, we've swapped out almost every faucet and bubbler throughout the school for a new um, unit. So we've been doing so much proactive maintenance and preventative maintenance um, in small dribs and drabs over time. Uh, I wouldn't have wanted to see our results if we hadn't have done some of those things. Um, there was one sink that I don't really think Robin even knew existed. It was behind the family consumer science room, next to the dishwasher, in a closet. <laughs> and um, that was the one that came in with high lead. It was also an original faucet <coughs> from the 1960s. So we immediately, when we got the results, made it a hand wash only station, and it's already been swapped out with a new one put in. And outside of that, almost every single one is under one part, what, uh, part per billion, um, which is really good. Um, the only other things we were given outside of, so when you get done with this thing, they give you their recommendations of what you're supposed to do. So one recommendation was to remove that faucet, we did that, that's done. The second one was for any of the ones that are like a two or a three, we should run the water for 30 seconds before using it or tell the kids to drink out of the filtered water stations throughout the building. We have seven filtered, cool, chilled, filtered water stations throughout the building. That's really where most people in our building drink. Almost everything else is not used. Um, there wasn't a single bubbler that was above the one part per billion. So I feel like every single place where kids would normally drink in our school is not only within the EPA standards, but is in the more rigid Vermont um, Agency of Natural Resources standard. So we feel really good about this, and it was kind of um, 
validating for all the work that we've been doing over the years to see that our school fared so well. When we signed up, I didn't know that they were so public about their results. <laughs> I'm just so glad that we're not on the news. <laughs> Okay. I don't think they have any questions, but. So it's just one faucet that's been replaced. Mm -hmm. they're, and they're gonna come back. In six weeks, we, they send us the four files and then we run the same test again for that faucet, ship it to them, and then they'll tell us that we're good. Okay. Any questions? Thank you, Joan. Okay, so that brings us now to uh, staff matters item E1. We have two unpaid Leave re requests. Uh, we have the letters are in your attachments. I believe it's Katina Tetro and Janice Malti. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Tetro is a para, is that right? Yes. She's requesting just five days. Yeah. And then Ms. Soraldi is a teacher and she wants a, a one year leave of absence. And the administration is recommending to accept the consent. I'll make the motion. Thank you. I'll second it. Thanks, Steve. Any discussion or questions on those? Hearing none. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Approved 8 0 for those two. Um, I assume the other two have been withdrawn. To mark the agenda. Correct. Okay. That brings us to item E2, teacher retirement. Uh, Ms. Lang is requesting to retire May 1st and asks that the board waive the separation fee. <coughs> I think this could qualify um, for executive session uh, because of the fact that we're discussing uh, <coughs> uh, a contract that's in place with an employee. Um, and I believe it could, we have to have a finding that it could put the board uh, at a disadvantage to do so in public session. So I'm going to go for a motion. That I that motion. Thank you. Second. Thank you, thank you Jeff. Um, and the reason is because we're going to be discussing possibly some strategies involved here. Right. And we don't want to do that. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any questions or discussion? All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, so item E2 will move to executive session. And we will uh, ask the superintendent and the last job to stick around for that. Mm. And Kathy? <laughs> she, <laughs> she's not going to have this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I, and I think that's really what she was asking for. So she's brought up the one vote thing before, and I think we this understanding goes back to constitutionality of when we were doing the articles about it. Right, and I mean, she, all these items one. she talked about were, came up on the floor and by other individuals, and, and um, I don't know the woman's name who brought this up, but you and I were talking to her after, after the meeting, and she came back to me. And, um, and I tried to explain to her, you know, like, everybody's your representative, and, she said, yeah, yeah, I get that, but only one vote's coming from Fairfield. And, and no disrespect, but you don't know how Fairfield is. You know, and I think um, there's some truth to that, but there's also, I mean, we're all in it for all the kids. Um, and I think it's just going to take time for that to sink in. So, yeah, we didn't have a choice. We didn't have a choice. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, unfortunately, at the end of the day, I told her that. It's, it's you know, it's, it's what the law says. Because so. we try. Yeah. yeah, and that's one of the reasons why all the candidates vote for yes, all the board members. Mm -hmm. And then, and then someone you know talked about not allowing the retirement uh, money to be used, invested in companies that make us all rifles. I mean, and that's just we don't have any control over that. We don't have any control over that. No, that's a, that's a state. That's okay. a state. Or the retirement. Sure the retirement system. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know what your feeling is. I mean, that's my suggestion. I think 
Um, I think it would be appreciated by the community there if we um, opened it up and let the fire away. Well, and maybe somebody can ask around to find out what people think is the best time to do that. You mean after the main meeting up there, or? Uh, I mean, whether the informational meeting beforehand. Yeah, well, yeah, whether they they want to do that at, in May or whether they want to do it at the budget yeah. informational meeting or they want to do it, you know, some other time. I hate to just do that and have nobody show up. Right. Well, we're going to be there for the main meeting anyway. Yeah. Right. So if we could if we could add the Q and A thing to the end of that meeting, and I, I think they really just kind of want to ask the questions they would have asked at town meeting if they would have been allowed to. I think. Game as the rest of you are. It's always good to have people come. Okay. Yep. You're doing all the talking, so answering. <laughs> I can pass that buck pretty easy. <laughs> okay, that's what we'll do then. We'll, uh, set that on the, the agenda for May. Uh, May that is. That, is that the end of May? Yes. Okay. Did I cover everything you wanted to? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. All right. Let's move to uh, action on or uh, item eight. Other business. We have uh, a number of warrants. Motion to approve. All right. Second. Jack. Any discussion on those? None. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Warrants approved 8 0. Administrator's reports. Attachment 8 B. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll make it brief. Uh, Jim stole my thunder. Um, I just wanted to. Also, congratulate Julie for um, for her for demotion to superintendent. Uh, <laughs> no, but uh, really she'll nice. have a lot more meetings up there. Yes, she'll have a lot of meetings. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And if you notice, she's on the front page. Oh, she is today. Yep. Yep. And we're in the we're in. The sad thing is we are in the process already of um, looking for a replacement. And we'll be in school spring. It is on school spring. It is on school spring. It is on school spring. So we're set. So uh, I also, I've said this the other day, but now that she's into it a little bit, I want to also take a chance and thank Heather Fitzgibbons again for uh, taking over with Fairfield. Uh, I understand things are going well. And she's enjoying it, and um, can't stay. <laughs> <laughs> but we really every time this principal goes over there, they never come back. They're a good teacher sure. there. But uh, and once again, this is a neat thing about a merge district that, that we can utilize each other's talents when needed. So, Heather, thank you. Sean theoretically is back sometime in April. The final thing, I want to just clarify if there are any people who do have questions relative to, as you know, our Secretary of Education. That was and my next question. I know it might. <laughs> uh, has resigned. And um, they're in the process of looking for a replacement. They recently, <coughs> as of today or as of yesterday, have an interim who happens to be the assistant, one of the assistant directors of um, uh, education. So um, that's Heather Bushy. And she will be in place until the State Board of Education goes through a process and brings, I've heard between three and four, depending on what newspaper I'm reading, mm -hmm. but three or four names to the governor who will then select a, uh, a new Secretary of Education. Is one of them Kevin Dirk? 
it wouldn't matter because Kevin Earth would not even consider it. <laughs> Some of them Unfortunately, the position has become way, way too political. Yeah. It was starting to forget about education. Is there any insight that as to why it's so sudden? Why? Uh, Nothing that's not personal. Okay. Um, my biggest concern is some scuttlebutt I'm hearing from the governor that says he's much, he's told the state board he's much more interested in a manager than a person who has education experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, <laughs> I'm just going to apply. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should still be fine. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I just think it's, um, <clears throat> there's a lot of pushback on that because you can be a manager, but there's so much intricacies, as you well know, as board members and leaders of, of, of understanding education, understanding the, the challenges. But um, they'll work through that. They have not given us a timeline, so they hope they're going to be timely. It, as, how it affects Act 46, of course it doesn't affect us, but for the one third of the state who yet has merged. I received an email today, and maybe all of you did, from this AOE saying timeline's the same, they're moving forward. Uh, Rebecca said something, she, she was at a meeting I was at last Friday, and her response to that question was, the AOE is an institution, it's not a person and the institution will continue, and issues like 46 will continue to move forward. So, I hate to see her go. I think she was in a, an, anybody in that position was in an untenable position, and if anybody had to be in an in, in the untenable position, that Rebecca was an appropriate person. And really supported Mabel Rod. Yeah. And that's that's it. Unless you have questions, any questions? All right. You have some board administrators for us. I will pass it out as as the my colleagues talk. Okay. What else? What CIP approval is coming up? for a future meeting. Jill, you want to explain? I'm happy to speak to that. Um, so our CIP is the continuous improvement plan that all districts do. And I've been spending the past month or few months actually working on our continuous improvement plan. And we have a new platform this year that all schools are required to use. And with that new platform also comes a new section for the board to look at the CIP, our continuous improvement plan, to make sure that you agree to the mission and the direction that we're moving in, and for you to have um, the opportunity to weigh in and to approve it. So that will be happening in June. And um, so I just submitted it, and there's four components that Maple Run is working on. So that's based on our data from SBAC and local assessments. So we've got a math section that we're working on. We've got ELA and writing and writer's workshop. And we have positive climate for schools and professional development of four components. And so the CAP is really important because that's how we base our programming from the federal government. Um, so you will get a copy of that. I've just submitted it. And the AOE gives us feedback on on what we've submitted. So our first draft has just been put forward. Thank you. Sounds interesting. Is there, is there anything else you want to? You want me to keep going? Yeah, you might as well go. Sure, I'll just, <laughs> just keep going. Um, uh, the other thing that I did just want to mention this evening was a message that um, the Wellness Policy Committee has asked me to just share with you, and I want to thank the board for allowing this subcommittee to continue the research that they've done this year. Um, there's 
two more meetings that will happen between now and the end of the year. The next meeting is on Monday at State Tech from 3 o'clock to 4.30. Um, and so the goal will be to continue the research that they've done. Um, and after this year is finalized, they will bring back the recommendations to the administration in small pieces so that you can look at the work that they've done. Um, very proud of that work, and I just wanted to share that message with you as well. Thank you. Let's go to uh, The poster over on the side uh, shows our first attempt to do a career and job fair. Um, we had the very able assistance of David Kimmel, who also provided us with two um, huge signs about the size of the windows. Uh, I couldn't fit them in the back seat of my car. And I assure you they will leave my office and be in yours soon. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to try to bend Martha's arm just a little to have one of those signs that roll up from the floor. Why not bring my floor? That's okay. That was great. I just <laughs> taunt to cart them around the window. So that was our first attempt. A um, little over 70, I think, vendors at the, the day. We had some great uh, interviews with. Um, some students from the Tech Center who were in the Human Services Program looking for peer educator jobs. They did an excellent job presenting themselves. I uh, also had some great interviews with folks from the public sector who are were looking at some of our job openings for subs or maintenance or um, secretarial positions. I'll just say if you would just pass those on to the board members. These, these were the packets that we news that had some information on um, our, the positions that we had open, our application form, our wage schedules, uh, the benefits, and a short blurb on the benefits of working with us. Uh, I thought we had some very good exposure, both students and the, the general public. And we, we plan to continue uh, to do this in other job fairs and career fairs. We are always looking for people with uh, some great skills to join us as subs, substitute teachers, maintenance workers, uh, clerical staff. Um, we will be delivering teacher contracts um, this Friday for distribution, Friday and Monday, to our teachers. Uh, and this seems to be a very busy time. I think the week before, the week before the vacation, you know, it's just a little heck <laughs> time. Did you get some applications? We did. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you do? We got some applications. I have them. They're <coughs> principals. Um, they did exactly what I told them to do. They put their applications on schools for me, so they're coming through. I've also gotten some personal communication. Some people were very well prepared, wrote their resume, had great questions. So uh, I'm, I'm passing that information on to people who are looking for candidates. Okay. Any questions? So um, as Kathy just mentioned, uh, teacher contracts are going to be going out to the um, schools this weekend, first of next week. Business office works um, with the HR department to get those processed and completed and printed and delivered to the board chair for signature and then Done. <laughs> then um, brought back and folded and stuffed and ready to go. Um, our next uh, uh, group of contracts we'll be working on are the support staff contracts, so that's the next in the queue. Um, We've started working on the setup of our FY19 database for our new fiscal year, um, setting that all up, getting ready for the information to start processing information in, in that year, um, finalizing, um, having the schools uh, finalize and put in their final purchase orders for the year so I can get a better um, look at how we think we're going to end the fiscal year, so that's ongoing right now. Um, and then starting the process of reviewing contracts for next year, um, food service, uh, 
snow removal, you know, that one was done last year. Um, contracts, review and note once might need to go out to bid and or renewed by the board. And so we are trying to follow in the next couple of months. Questions? Okay. Michelle's not here today. No. Uh, Joanne. Well, I just have to say that as happy as I am for Julie and Jeff, I'm considering going into mourning for a <laughs> period of time. I'm not quite sure what's appropriate. Um, on a happier note, I guess, um, I'm doing a lot of collaboration with the tech center, which has been awesome. Um, we have kind of a pilot that we've created, um, an opportunity for a student um, who currently attends an out-of-district school um, to experience the tech center well before it's time for that person to go there. And it's really about creating opportunity and a sense of excitement um, about what the future holds. So we're pretty excited about that. We don't know how successful it will be, but we're going to give it a try. Um, and the tech center has also been doing a lot of work this year uh, around trauma-informed schools. And so I'm going to um, follow that up. Teachers the staff have been asking about, um, OK, so now that I know all of this about trauma, what do I do in my classroom? And so I'm going to be working with them uh, in a couple of weeks to, to do some practical classroom strategies um, when you're working with that population of, of kids. So I'm excited about that. Um, and then you heard earlier about the safety work that's been going on. So we've been working uh, with VFA on the safety team uh, and with Chief Taylor and Captain Hogue. And that has been fabulous. Um, as Kevin mentioned, they're just they're awesome to work with. So that's kind of that. So. Questions for Joanne? Finish off with Julie. Yeah. <laughs> so if you, I don't have enough for everyone. I thought um, it would be a good time uh, since we just received verification of our numbers of special education students. We've been talking about efficiencies. We've been talking about uh, trying to build capacity. Um, and so I wanted to give you you have two pictures there. I'll wait till everyone gets them. <clears throat> Something called the child count is when a point in time on December 1st of every year, uh, the state of Vermont, we submit all our information to them and they tell us how many children we have currently eligible for special education, what disabilities, nationalities, gender, all of that kind of demographic information. And um, we have steadily grown over the past several years. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, I, most of that is uh, not going to be surprising to anyone. Um, the first slide that you'll see with the three groups of bars is by municipality. So that includes BFA. But it's by Fairfield, St. Albans City, and St. Albans Town as municipalities. And over three years, so 16, 17, and 18, um, we have increased the numbers of students in all of our communities that are eligible for special education. But you will see that families residing in the city have had a larger increase overall, and that you can see that the numbers of families in the city who have children and youth that are disabled is the largest in our community. As a percentage, though, is Fairfield still pretty high? Right? Not, but no, I, I, our overall percentage is um, about 20%. Okay. Fairfield is smaller. Town is the smallest percentage um, per capita. Um, and then, and I didn't prepare that for that, but that's off my okay. recollection. Absolutely. So is the city, I mean, is this representing like a thousand kids? Or if you look at city, those are actual numbers of children. Those are not is the numerator though. What's the denominator? Is it's not a percentage. It's so the number of students in the city school is seven hundred ish. That's right. What I'm looking at that would be across St. Albans City School and BFA. 
I, oh, I, yeah, I understand that. I was just trying to get a sense of the percentage. If you're looking at the percentage of kids that are eligible at St. Albans City School, it's about 26 percent. Uh, overall, as a school district, it's 20 percent. We have, um, if you turn to the other side, you can see the categories of disability. And so we can look a little more closely at where children are eligible and uh, what the increase is, the areas where the increase is. So the largest number of students by far are children who are considered developmental delayed. That's children between the ages of three and eight who are first eligible for special education. That's the criteria where you really want to catch students and give them prevention. So I am not surprised that over the past several years, as we have expanded pre-K opportunities, as we have um, bused students to pre-K, that as we have had all day programming, there were children out there that we were not serving previously that we are serving. Uh, I think the largest actual number of children that we found eligible would be in that category. Uh, we increased it from 20 each year over the past several years. So the number of kids aren't going up, it's the number we're actually finding. We're doing a better job of finding I, I think it's both things really? in some ways. We certainly are seeing more children experiencing um, childhood trauma, adverse childhood experiences that are resulting in emotional disturbance is another category that's increased quite a bit in our community. We also are an area, the largest area in the county for receiving children in foster care. So, and we educate all those children as well in our communities, all of our communities. So we have a lot of children who have experienced adverse childhood uh, trauma and so forth that have resulted in um, having disabilities. I think those are the two largest areas. If you look at more instructionally based areas such as a specific learning disability and reading, <coughs> even though nationally that is by far the largest category of disability, um, that's not an area where we're experiencing large growth. It, it really in some ways we have. It's a year on year. Um, you know, specific learning disabilities, do they improve conditions like that are medical, like ADD or ADHD? Typically those disabilities, that those kinds of conditions come under what's called an other health impairment, which is also one of our larger categories. Okay. It's hard to actually read those categories. I know, and I did. And again, I, I, I didn't want to give too much specific information. I wanted you to have an idea of trends. And it is definitely something that we will look at all the time, but our communities are as a percentage overall of our Do you think maybe you could just, in case they want to write it in, just read across? Absolutely. So the first, if we're looking at this one, the first area, it's, thank you. There's a, right, I have it memorized. The first is autism. So we've seen increases overall, as the whole country has, in children being identified as having autism. The next, as I said, is developmental delay, and those are, young, are very young children. The third is emotional disturbance. The fourth is hearing loss. The next is intellectual disability and multiple disabilities. Those three there, along with the one at the very end, visual impairment, are what we call low incidence disabilities. They're not very frequently found. Um, and then other health impairment is a category where lots of conditions fall under that category. ADHD, epilepsy, all kinds of conditions might fall there. A specific learning disability would be um, challenges in reading, writing, and mathematics and speech and language impairment is next and as i said before visual impairment is the last one there are other categories out there very, uh, but um very infrequent these are the ones that are in our schools how do these compare like statewide nationally i mean is there a trend and i mean i just see the emotional um, mm -hmm. disturbance one 
this, uh, this, I mean, we're talking. I know we're talking small. We're not talking large populations between these these bars. So some of them essentially are little change. But uh, I mean, what's the trend as, nationally, statewide, or as a state, we identify children uh, as having emotional disturbance more than three times the national average. That's great. So is it, we're doing a better job. I think there are many factors. It's being examined very closely. Um, but I do believe that we have more services. We have closer relationships with um, our mental health agencies and so forth. We have more access to school psychologists. Uh, I think that that's often how students are diagnosed because we're looking. I think there are other states that look less closely. I think that's a very broad generalization for you, Mike. But so it's hard to compare how we do state to state because it sounds like there's different standards in each different state. Well, of course the, the feds collect that information, um, but you're right. I mean, some states tweak the criteria for these categories differently. Years ago, Mississippi had an unwritten rule that they weren't going to find anyone eligible in emotional disturbance. They just didn't believe in it. So. I think we do a good job at uh, ensuring that we find all students who struggle. I think we need to do more work to determine whether we need children to be eligible for special ed in order to help them when they struggle. I think that's further work to do. Um, but so I don't know if it's a good thing that the bar is going up or a bad thing. I do know that. You know, it is a challenge when we have increasing numbers. It is it's special education. When you talk about education being 80% salary and benefits, special education is more like 90% salary and benefits. It's a very person-heavy <coughs> endeavor. Um, and yet, when we are finding, when I look at this and say, wow, we went up 40 students this year, what does that look like? And I see that 20 of those students were in early childhood. I feel a little better about that because I want to be finding those children early and intervening and hopefully dismissing them from special ed. So did, didn't we, Franklin County, have something that would sort of go out and look for kids zero through three? Absolutely. And Every track on the birth, the birth mm -hmm. records? Is that still in effect? Is, yes, is, it's the federal law, okay. and um, it's called Child Find. Yeah. We have to find So you can actually get services before they get to the three-year-old. Well, we do not give those services. We don't give them The numbers. Agency of Human Services okay. does, and in this county, uh, NCSX provides those services. Right, so you can actually get any mighty speech work coming in. Right, and they'd be getting those services better. from NCSX. Yeah, right. And they meet with our early childhood folks every month. Right. and talk about children who will be turning three soon that will then become okay. the school district's responsibility. So they have really strong communication around those issues. So a little bit more information than maybe you were looking for, but it is, I felt it was timely to just get the information. Okay. Okay. Any other questions for you? All right, that brings us to item, agenda items for next meetings. Uh, let's see, we, we put the uh, municipal discussion and the next. Or, oh, or no, and next early is early. Oh, okay. Okay. Right, so we two weeks there, four weeks there. The famous board retreat there. And CIP Anything else? <coughs> All right. In that case, uh, I would look for a motion then to go into executive session since we've already found that a reason exists under 1 DSA 313A1 A and B to discuss uh, teacher retirement for Ms. Lang. Yeah, some of them. All right. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? No, no, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Oh, by the way, inviting the superintendent, Kathy and Joe. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Extension. Executive session. Thank you, everybody.